Welcome to the stage, author of Molly's Game, Molly Bloom. Hello, everyone. So I am here with Simon Sinek. Yes. And the way I met Simon is kind of strange. I became friends with some of the police chiefs in my town because I am a friend of law enforcement now, rule following citizen. And um, they, one of the police chiefs, she's a woman, she's extraordinary. She said, you have to meet Simon Sinek. And I said, I, I'm a huge fan. How do you know him? And she said, I'm part of this group that he put together to improve upon law enforcement. And that is just Simon, the way he lives his life. There's no problem too complex, too big. He has a vision of the world, a better world, a more just world, a more humane world. And he doesn't just talk about it. He gets into action. Uh, the work he's done with leaders and organizations has catalyzed an evolution of culture out from a fear-based self-preservationist mind and into a higher, more conscious state. So it is such an honor to be here to talk about his life and his work and the art of impact. So Simon, hello. Thanks, Molly. Yeah. <laughs> Molly Bloom. So it wasn't a light lift, this vision of yours, this vision of a better world. On our pre-call, we talked about at the beginning, you were booed, you were heckled, your credibility was called into question. People said things like, you don't understand business, and yet you persisted. So my question is, where does your why come from and where does this deep, relentless conviction behind it? I think that it's, it's I think of an, like an artist sensibility. If you talk to an artist and say, why do you paint? Why do you dance? Um, they don't understand the question. The answer they give is, I can't not, yeah. right? It's, there's compulsion. And not all ideas uh, have compulsion. You know, they don't feed our souls. And, you know, I think for, for and probably shared by a lot of people in this room, you know, the question is, is what ideas should we be stubborn with and what ideas should we know when to quit? And I think it's an often de a debate, like you have to know when to quit and you should never quit. And I think the answer is, is if you can't stop thinking about it, if the idea has so much soul, if, the old, if it, it, it just compels you, those are the ones that we never quit, where the other ones, sure, you, you can sort of figure out a time to walk away. And that is what this became for me. Um, uh, it, it was something I couldn't not do. Um, and when you have that kind of belief in something, desperate belief, and people have it in their families, they have it in their faith, they have desperate belief in something. Um, the, the criticism um, becomes part of the fun, mm. frankly. Um, you're, I mean, the story you're, you're, talk, you're talking about is true. It happened in the early days when I was talking about Start With Why, mm -hmm. I was on a stage talking to a, a fairly large group of entrepreneurs and business owners. And um, the very first, it wasn't a question, the very first statement made when we went to Q&A, a guy just with the microphone said, um, uh, I think you're naive. Um, I don't think you're, you've never run a multi-billion dollar company. Um, I think your ideas are uh, useless in the real world and I don't think it'll ever work um, and my answer was so don't do it <laughs> next question like and and it's not because I'm I'm was being difficult it's because I never saw my job to convince people because I don't think I'm right and I don't think that I have answers I think I have a point of view that's all and so I'm simply sharing my point of view. And if you don't share my point of view, I'm totally fine with that. You know, if you want to run your business your way, you run it your way. I just think business could run this way. 
Um, and so uh, I never took it personally, quite frankly, when, when I got comments like that or when they questioned my, my credentials or anything like that. You never took it personally or you were able to reframe it? No, I didn't. I, I didn't, genuinely didn't take it personally. Okay. Like, like I mean, it happened at another one where the very first question was, "What are your credentials?" After I've just given this whole speech, you know, and I said none. And just so he knew I wasn't joking, I elaborated and said, "I have no advanced degrees. I've made no formal study of this. This is just my point of view." <laughs> um, and I think, I think one of the things that we have to remember, and I think young people don't realize this, is when someone gives you a shot when they decide to put you on a stage and give you a microphone, or if they give you a job, or if they um, open a door for you or make an introduction for you, you don't have to prove yourself because you've already been vetted. Somebody else has already said, I mean, you see this in new employees all the time. You know, you know, the, com the company Chanel, like Chanel, they have this rule that I absolutely love that new, new senior executives are not allowed to speak in meetings for the first 90 days of their employment. They want you to shut up and listen. And the reason they do that is because new employees so often feel they have to talk in every meeting to prove that you made the right choice to hire them. They're like, we know you're smart, we hired you. Shut up and learn. And I, and I, and I think that's correct. And, and, I, and, and yeah, I have nothing else. <laughs> At what point, in, was it in your childhood? Was it in, I mean, at what point did you decide this was your why and this was your mission and you were going to not quit? So no one decides what their why is. Mm -hmm. Your why is inside you. And if you're fortunate enough to go on the journey of discovery, um, well, it's not fortunate enough. If you choose to go on the journey of discovery um, and you're able to, put that why into words. So the thing that drives your gut, like there's no part of your stomach that makes decisions, right? You, you know, your gut feeling comes from somewhere uh, and it is this deep seated purpose, cause or belief that we all have because we're all products of our upbringing and you are who you are. And, um, and so for me, it wasn't a question of um, uh, deciding on it, but it was discovering it and not uncommon you can go through a process of discovery because you just decide you want to, um, or you can very often struggle uh, reveals your why to you. Um, I think that's probably very much your case as well. You know, you had to hit the bottom before you realized who you were. Um, uh, and my story is not dissimilar, either way, I, I didn't go to, I'm not a convicted felon. Um, <laughs> Lame. <laughs> Um, uh, but you're my favorite convicted felon. The, 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 but I, I had to like, I had to face uh, what I thought was bankruptcy. I had to face collapse. I had to face um, humiliation um, uh, to, to discover what my cause was. And, and I think you probably share this as well, which is I, I couldn't have done it alone. And it, it, it took a friend coming to me in this very dark place that I spent all of my energy pretending that I was happy, more successful and more in control than I really felt. Um, uh, and lying, hiding and faking is exhausting. Mm. Um, and it, it took a friend to say, something's not right. Even my, fa I was so good at it, even my family didn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. And, but this friend did and I came clean and all of the energy went into, that was going into lying, hiding and faking went into um, rediscovering passion. Um, and it wasn't the discovering of my why that set me on the path. It was the discovering of my why and then wanting desperately to share with my friends because I love my friends and I want them to have what I found. And they started making crazy life changes and making these huge decisions with total confidence. And they would invite me to their homes to share it with their friends. And I would literally stand in someone's living room talking about this thing called the why. And that's what ignite, ignited the spark, that I realized that I, I had something to give. Um, um, and you discover, you discover service. I mean, this is what a life of service means, which is, um, you know, the, the reason, you know, people keep talking about 
or we're told you have a gift, you know, well, the very definition of a gift is it's supposed to be given. And I think that if you have a gift and you're not sharing it, I think you're just selfish. What if we don't know our why? How do we unearth it? There's many ways to do it. Um, you know, I, I've written a book about, about it, Find Your Why, and we have like stuff online to help people find it. But there's multiple ways to do it. Um, uh, I can tell you a fun way. It's, uh, some of you may know about it. It's called the Friends Exercise, uh, which is really fun, which is go to a friend who you love and who loves you. Um, um, the kind of friend that if you called them at three o'clock in the morning, you know they would take your call. And if they called you, you would absolutely be there for them. Do not do this with um, a sibling. Do not do this with a parent. And do not do this with a spouse. It doesn't work. Because um, they think they know you. Um, no, go to a friend, a friend and, and who, who you love and ask them this very simple question. Why are we friends? And they're going to look at you like you're crazy. Because you're asking them to put into words a feeling and the part of the brain that controls our emotions doesn't control language so we struggle and ironically you actually stop asking the question why because the question why elicits emotional responses and you convert to a rational question come on you'll say what specifically is it about me that i know that you would be there for me no matter what and they will struggle and they will hem and the ha and they go oh, i don't know and they'll start describing you uh, you're trustworthy, you're funny, um, you're always there for me, and you have to play devil's advocate. And you go, great, that's the definition of a friend. What specifically is it about me that I, I know you'd be there for me no matter what? And they're gonna go through a few rounds of this. You cannot help them, you cannot let anybody else help them, you have to let them go through the stress. And eventually, after a bunch of rounds, they will give up and they will stop describing you and they will start talking about themselves. And my friends said to me, Simon, I don't know. All I know is I don't even have to talk to you. I can just sit in a room with you and I feel inspired. And I got goosebumps. In fact, I'm getting them right now. And uh, that's because they put into words something that is deep inside of me and you will, you know you've, you're, you're, you're there when you have the emotional response to what they're describing about themselves. You will well up, you will have goosebumps, something will happen. And if you do this with multiple friends, you will get similar if not the exact same answer because the thing you give to the world, your why, is the reason they love you. It's the thing they want in their life that fills that missing gap that they don't have, which is why we're not friends with everyone. So it's a wonderful, wonderful way to, to find your why. I love that. Um, <clears throat> so kind of the next, so how long did it take before there was that inflection point, before that was that the tipping point where people started to embrace this concept? How long were you out there speaking? How long before diffusion theory essentially took place? Uh, so this is the thing that is just, for me, fascinating about learning the discipline of starting with why mm -hmm. and following the religion of law of diffusion of innovations, which is ignoring the majority and finding the early adopters, which, which is religion to me. I, I based my whole career and, and that's how ideas spread on that beautiful idea. Um, it happened immediately. The minute I started talking about what I believed and, start, and stopped talking about what I did, things happened immediately. So for example, if I would go to a dinner party where you sit on a plane and somebody says, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And you actually answer that question. If you're lucky to find 10% of the people who are actually interested in that, you can have a conversation. Um, but if you talk about what you believe, you talk about um, how you view the world, um, people who believe what you believe were instantly drawn to you. And people who don't believe what you believe don't care and will walk away. And the people who are instantly drawn to you will say things like, there's someone I need to introduce you to. And so my career went from fine and it went like this. So I'll just give you one example. I first publicly articulated the concept of the golden circle and starting with why in January of 2006. Okay? By, I think it was about May, May or June of 2006, I was standing in the Pentagon presenting to the Chief of Staff and Secretary of the, uh, of the Air Force. So one of the members of the Joint Chiefs. I'm the same idiot, okay? <laughs> Nothing has changed. 
The difference was the way I got there was I talked about what I believed and they said, there's somebody I need you to meet. That's how I got my book deal. Somebody said to me, I went out for dinner with somebody, I talk about what I believe. They said, I need to introduce you to this editor. I, tell, I have a conversation, I tell him what I believe. He says, I need you to meet my publisher. I have a 29 minute conversation with the publisher and three days later they offered me a book deal. And, and it's only because I worked very hard to talk about what I believed. You have to eventually talk about what you do because people want proof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, the, it's not that I think the what's unimportant, it's that the order's wrong. People talk about what they do, they talk about how they do it, and they mm -hmm. rarely talk about what they believe. I talk about what I believe, how I do it, and then I'll tell you about what I do. So, and the order matches the biology of human decision making, which is why it works. Can you talk a little bit about that biology? Because I think it's fascinating how you back these theories up with neuroscience. Yeah, I mean, and it's not very, it's not very controversial in neuroscience. No, it's, it's not. Neuroscience 101. Right. You know, um, it's really basic stuff, which is good um, uh, because I'm not a neuroscientist. The, um, but I did check everything out with a neuroscientist. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm not, you know, I think there's a lot of ideas in the market that the, the sellers of those ideas, um, whether they're commercial ideas or just philosophical ideas, the sellers of those ideas, the, the spreaders of those ideas are looking for the buyers to just believe or take it on faith. Mm -hmm. Like the universe will provide. That's one of my favorite ones. You just ask the universe, you know? And I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> but my question is, why does the universe do that? Like, I want to know the reason why that happens. Like, I'm not satisfied with, if you start with talking about what you believe, then things will follow. I know it's to be true, but why? Mm -hmm. And if you ask that question enough times, necessarily you end up at the origins of the human species and anthropology and biology and why this legacy machine was built the way it it was to respond to the world around us so that we will survive. And so necessarily when you start asking the questions about those things that we're asked to take on faith, you, you end up at biology and anthropology and it sort of all starts to make sense. It also helps you understand why things don't work. Right. Um, or when our systems get short circuited, you know, we're a very old machine living in a very modern world. We're not built for this. So, Kind of the next step in this evolution was leaders eat last. And you expanded your ideas outside of self and this motivation and this passion into a more universal approach that was in direct contradiction to the way that the culture of business and leadership was at the time, getting away from the Jack Welsh of it all. And into more humane leadership uh, and the part there, there's many parts of this work that's so fascinating to me, but one that I think is so profound is starting to understand the conditions under which humans thrive. Um, and you do, you do a lot of, uh, talking about fear and safety and keep, and, you know, business up until this point, it was very much about pitting people against each other. Uh, the bottom line, shareholder supremacy, just these conditions that are completely antithetical to how humans survive and, or thrive and are pro productive. What was it? Were you already working with the military at this point? So I'd have a, so the, the Air Force were early adopters of my work. I mean, right, right from the beginning. And so I'd had a, a I continue to have a long relationship What's interesting about the story of humanity and, and the concept of Leaders Eat Last, first of all, the title Leaders Eat Last comes from a conversation I had with a Marine. Right. I said, what makes Marines better than uh, all, the other, all the others? And he said, officers eat last. Hmm. Uh, and it's a concept shared across the military. It just happened to be with a Marine. That's where that title comes from. And the opening story in Leaders Eat Last is a war story. Mm -hmm. um, a, you know, I like to joke that, they're, that uh, in the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. And in business, we give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others so that we may gain. Right. <laughs> and, uh, um, but the true origin story for Leaders Eat Less, which is not in the book, was um, when... Uh, came from an, ex uh, and I don't talk about it that often. I have talked about it, but I don't talk about it that often, which is I had the opportunity to go to Afghanistan uh, with the Air Force. 
Um, I had been doing a lot of work with the mobility forces. Air, the air mobility forces um, are the branch of the Air Force that um, are responsible for all of the, the big planes that don't drop bombs or shoot bullets. So no fighter jets, no bombers, but the tankers, the cargo planes, Air Force One, all of that stuff belongs to Air Mobility Command. And the general who was in charge, you know, he said, you know, you've got to know us really well, but it would mean a lot to me if you would be willing to go to Iraq or Afghanistan to see our men and women perform their duty. I would like you to see what they do. Would you be willing to go? And I said, yes. Um, and um, they chose Afghanistan. And I didn't tell my family um, and very few friends um, for the simple reasons I didn't want them to worry. Um, I told my parents that I was going away with the Air Force for a few days, true. I told them I was going to Germany, true. I told them I'd be on a lot of planes, so I'd probably be out of touch for a while, true. I just didn't tell them I was going from Germany to Afghanistan. And minor detail. Minor detail. And it became very real when I was at Dover Air Force Base, uh, which is where we left from. And the first thing we got was a tour of the mortuary where all of the fallen soldiers came through Dover. And then we went and I got fitted for my uh, Kevlar vest and helmet. And they asked me, do you want the extra ceramic plate? I was like, yes. <laughs> um, we flew. <laughs> We flew uh, to Germany on a C5, amazing experience, big, big, huge cargo plane with like whole helicopters in the back. Um, and then we flew to Bagram uh, on a KC-135 tanker and the Air Force was stretched so thin that they were using tankers to bring inbound and stuff. These planes aren't designed to land in war zones. They have no defensive capabilities. They have no flares, they have nothing. And everything was fine um, and we landed in Bagram and the, the, door, the side door of the plane was open, but we, we were still on the plane. We hadn't gotten off. And we'd been on the ground maybe 10 minutes. This is 10 o'clock at night. It's the middle of the night. They do that for safety because we have no defensive measures. Um, uh, we were on the ground for maybe 10 minutes and the base came on a rocket attack. And three rockets hit 100 yards off our nose. And you could hear them. And the air raid sirens blared. And the, through the speaker, they told everybody to go to their bunkers to cover. And we we're on a plane. And there's nothing we could do. And, and nobody put on their helmets or their vests because our plane is filled with gas. That's not going to do anything. And everybody was weirdly relaxed. And for those who of you, and I think there's a couple of you in the audience who've been in a war zone, uh, you, you have all the feelings you're supposed to have, but you don't have them at the right times. So I was relaxed. Um, the air and sirens turned off, the all clear was given and we could go to our quarters. We went to our quarters, me and my two escorts, two officers who went with me. And, um, and my only responsibility was to do an airdrop mission and they're not regularly scheduled. So we went to our quarters. We got like two, maybe three hours of sleep if we were really lucky, got up super early in the morning. Then we uh, did an airdrop in a C-17 where we flew an hour and a half out to the middle of Afghanistan to a forward operating base, dropped down to 2,000 feet, the big door open at the back and supplies parachuted out the back and we were sitting right there watching it happen. It was an incredible experience. Come back to Bagram after the mission was completed and now the goal is to leave the country. And nothing's really regularly scheduled and you sort of, you have to find a plane that we could get on to come home. And we did, we found an aircraft that was an outbound air medical mission, which means they're taking away they're taking back home fallen soldiers and, 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 and Marines and airmen and, and sailors out of the war zone. And we had to get permission from the pilots. They said yes. And then we waited and 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 waited. And eventually we got on the plane, all of our stuff was strapped down. And about five minutes before we were supposed to leave, the pilot came up to us and says, I need to bump you. I need more room for stretchers. And if there's ever a good reason to get bumped off a plane, this is about as good as it gets. So we got off the plane and now the goal was to find another plane we could get on. And that's when we found out that there were no other planes going in the direction we needed to go until Tuesday and it was only Saturday. And in that moment, upon receiving that news, every fiber of my being sank. Um, I could feel the panic coming now that I didn't have before. 
I became a person that I am not, and I could see it happening. Like one of the PA offices, one of the public affairs offices said, I can get you on a flight to, you know, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, but you don't have the right visa. And I put my finger in his face and I said, you get me on that plane. Like, I don't talk to people that way. You were in fear. What's that? You were in fear. I, I was consumed by fear. Right. Um, uh, we went back to our quarters. We we're all pretty exhausted. And I lay on the bed and I closed my eyes. I said, no way, I'm sleeping. And my mind is racing, but I closed my eyes. One of the officers said, well, I'm gonna see if I can find another flight. And he left. And the, off the other officer said, well, I'm gonna go to the gym. <laughs> and because I was in my bed with my eyes closed, he thought I was sleeping. And as he walked out the room, he turned off the lights. I'm now left by myself in this dark room. My mind is racing and I'm consumed by fear. I am now convinced, I would bet money, I am 100% convinced that there's gonna be another rocket attack. It's definitely gonna land wherever I am. And the way that my parents are gonna find out that I am in Afghanistan is that someone is gonna knock on the door and tell them. I'm convinced. I, I, I don't wanna be there. I regretted saying yes. I'm lonely. And I'm in the purpose business, so I, I get this. And so I thought to myself, okay, you don't have a sense of purpose. That's what you need. You need purpose. You need purpose. Okay, so I started inventing purpose. I'm like, you're here to give witness and then come back and tell their story. And I'd feel amazing. And, and then like three minutes later, I wasn't amazing. I was back into deep panic and fear. And I would do this a couple of times. I, I would come up with some nonsense, and I think we do this ourselves. We come up with some sure. rationalized nonsense yep. that sort of lasts a little bit. Uh, and everything was exaggerated and compressed for me, you know? Um, and I, I couldn't come up with anything else. And so I lay in that bed and I, I gave up. I, I resigned myself to being powerless and stuck. You surrendered. Surrender, I, I just gave up, I surrendered. And, and in that moment of surrender, this intense calm came over me. I'd even go so far as to say excitement, where having now surrendered and given myself up to the situation, I decided that I wanted to serve, that I would volunteer, that I would give talks if they wanted around the base for troop morale. I would sweep floors if they wanted me to. I would carry boxes. I didn't care how menial the tasks were. I wanted to be there to serve. As if it were a movie, the timing was uncanny. Having just come to this realization, having just learned what true service means, that truly to live a life of service means the choice to serve those who serve others. Not everybody, to serve those who serve others. Having just come to this magical insight, as if the door flung open, it was Major Throckmorton. He said, there's another flight that's leaving. We can get on it. We can get it. There's another flight, but we have to leave now. We have to leave now. They're going to leave without us. Where's Matt? I'm like, he's at the gym. <laughs> so we ran to the gym. He's on the treadmill. Like, we got to go. We got to go. There's another flight. We got to go. Now, just as a quick aside, I'm not, a, in, I'm not military, so I'm not allowed to wear a uniform, anything like that. And I'm wearing uh, khakis and a golf shirt, which is like contractor wear and a pair of boots and I'm scruffy and I'm little so I kind of look like special forces <laughs> so when all the other troops see me run into the gym go up to one one guy and go we gotta go we gotta go we gotta go they're all like what's going on that was my little thrill you deserve anyway, it. Anyway, we, we, we ran back to our quarters. We grabbed our stuff. He didn't have time to shower. He threw his uniform back on. We grabbed our packs and ran out to the, the, the flight line to catch our plane. As soon as we got to the flight line, we could see the C-17 that we were going to board. And just as we got there, a security cordon came down and they wouldn't let us onto the field. Because somewhere else on base, there was a fallen soldier ceremony happening. And what happens is out of respect, everything on base stops. And so we sat on the curb and we waited. And while we were sitting on the curb, I told the guys what I had just gone through in the bed. 
And I, I wept. <laughs> it brings me to tears now. I wept as I told them the story. And one of the things people don't realize about the military is crying is just fine. Yeah. It's just fine. There's a lot of crying and it's just fine. They hold space. Yeah. And uh, we finally, the security cordon came back up and we went and boarded our, our aircraft. And what I haven't told you is the reason that this was an unscheduled aircraft and the reason um, it showed up is we would be carrying the soldier for whom they just had the ceremony. We got on the plane, we're the only three passengers on that plane. And the army brought upon the aircraft a single flag draped casket and laid it in the middle of the cargo bay. And all of the airmen stood at attention. I didn't know what to do. And I put my hand on my heart. I kind of felt like an idiot. And so I just stood at attention with them in this perfect line. As the army laid down the casket, they did a slow eight count salute to say goodbye to their comrade. We watched them march off the plane, hug and cry as they walked out of sight. The air crew got to work and strapped down the precious cargo. And then we left. It was a nine and a half hour flight overnight back to Ramstein, back to Germany. And as soon as we got in the air, everybody like staked out a piece of real estate to get some sleep. And w I was last because they all sort of scattered. And so I was left uh, sleeping next to the casket. Wow. Um, on every other flight I was on, we joked, we talked, we had a blast. On every other flight, I w on this flight, barely a word was spoken. On every other flight, I hung out in the cockpit, talked to the pilots. On this flight, I never visited the cockpit once. Um, and I will tell you, it was the greatest honor of my life, having just learned what true service means, getting to bring home someone who understands service more than I ever will. We get to Bagram, we get to Ramstein, and our final flight home is uh, an, 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 an air medical evacuation where we're bringing wounded, the wounded back to America from Germany. Um, some of them ambulatory, some of them not. And it's more relaxed on this flight. But in the back of the aircraft, there's a single gurney. You know, there's nurses tending to a whole bunch of troops. And there's, a, there's like four doctors tending to one Marine who's in what they call CCAT, which is an artificial coma. Uh, and I sort of stayed away out of discomfort from the back of the plane. And I sort of like at some point, I'm like, I should really go. Mm -hmm. So I went back and talked to the docs and they were, telling me his wounds, his buddy had stepped on an IED and was killed, and he took the shrapnel, he had shrapnel in the chest, he lost an eye, um, shrapnel in the skull, and, um, and they were telling me how uh, some of the trauma care that was being developed in Afghanistan and Iraq was slowly making its way to civilian hospitals back home, so even when they're wounded, they're giving back to us. And the head doc, the, the guy in charge, was a reservist from Austin who works in an ER. And I, I asked him a question, had I not gone through what I went through, I asked him a question I would never have asked him. I said, I said, you're a good guy. You work in an ER, you save lives for a living. Are these missions different than your job back home? And he looked at me and said, there is no comparison. He said, 90 to 95% of the people who come through the ER are either drunks or idiots. He says there's not a single drunk or idiot here. He says the honor I get on these missions doesn't equate to an entire career. We made it back to Ramstein, uh, back to uh, Andrews Air Force Base. We made it back to Andrews Air Force Base. We were the last plane to land right before a huge storm came in which was amazing that they let us land. And we got off Andrews and there was this, the biggest rainbow I've ever seen in my life over, over, the, over the base. I'll tell you one final piece to this. The deal I made with the general was that I would go do my thing and then he wanted me to come back to headquarters and report out what I had seen and share any insights that I may have gleaned. And so about two weeks later, I went back to headquarters and did just that. And I stood in an auditorium, smaller than this, and all of the brass was there, all the generals, a bunch of colonels, like all of the brass were there. And I told them what I went through and the airdrop and some things that I was really impressed by and some little tweaks that I could see. And I was going over in my head, do I want to tell the story of coming home with this casket? And I sort of like was debating and I finally decided to tell the story. And the emotions were raw. Mm. 
I mean, it had just happened and the emotions were raw. And I started telling the story and I, I couldn't. I swelled up and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get the words out. And something magical happened. And you realize the difference between private sector and these magical human beings. If I, and it's happened, if I'm on a stage and I well up and I get stuck, somebody in private sector will say, it's okay, don't worry, right? As if to push you aside. When I got stuck and welled up on that stage, two words were spoken by the four star who was sitting at the back of the room. He said, go on. As if to say, go on, you're safe, or go mm -hmm. on, we're with you. And that's amazing. Yeah. He I'm didn't say stop. In a time of pain, in a time of fear, in a time of overwhelm, he did not say stop. He said, go on. And this is why I wrote that book. Because you realize the power of community, the power of friendship, the power of, of a strong culture that is built on love. And I don't use that term lightly. If you ask folks in the military, I've, I've talked to the, the hardest of hardcore warriors and I say, what is it that makes you good at what you do? And they say love. Mm. They say love, they love each other. We call each other colleagues and coworkers. They call each other brother and sister and that relationship is real. And from that day on, when my friends struggle, I say, go on. Mm. And that's why that book exists. So powerful, and um, that that experience changed you. Hundred percent. I, I am who I am in part because of that. I think what people don't understand, and I think something that keeps us from going deeper into character and going deeper into service, is there's this misconception that we're supposed to be born this way. It's supposed to be natural and we're supposed to be a good person and we're supposed to be unselfish and we're supposed to be honest and not yell at people and not get frustrated. And in my experience, that is not the case. It is an unnatural way of being. It is a way of being that forces us to go into the shadows, to look at our base operating system and realize its flaws and realize that there are two parts of us there's the part that is fearful and selfish and self-preservationist and greedy. And then there's a higher part that we can cultivate and that we can train, but it, but it takes practice. When you are sitting with leaders or people that want to transform, yeah. that are brave enough to know that they need to be better, yeah. how do they start? What's the work? It's not... I mean, I wish I had something profound to tell you. I mean, you know, the first step is, you know, admitting you have a problem, you know? Yeah. Um, this is all sounding familiar. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a great irony in being human, which is it's really hard to be human. Unquestionably. You know, cats don't have to work hard to be cats. No. But humans have to work really hard to be humans. Be good humans, for sure. You know? Yeah. And there's, that's, that's funny to me, you know, that it's, that it's not just natural. In fact, if it's just instinct, it's not gonna go well. No. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think w to accept the fact that human beings and human relationships are and will always be messy is, is part of it, to, to know that. I am messy, you are messy, we are messy, all of my relationships are messy, and I, we are constantly working on the skills to find order in the chaos and make it just a little less messy today. But it's always gonna be messy. And I think the first part of what you're talking about, the question you're asking, you are better qualified to answer than me, which is it starts with accountability. And you are, in my opinion, and the reason I have such love for you is you are the patron saint of accountability. 
uh, because when you were faced with a situation where self-preservation was an option, you chose not to take it. And your example is so extreme. Just, just really a quick aside for those who don't know. When Molly was busted by the feds, um, <laughs> do you know who Molly is? <laughs> so, If you've ever seen the movie Molly's Game, that's Molly. Uh, <laughs> when Molly was busted by the feds, they offered her a deal that she could stay out of jail if she simply just gave up some names. Or she could not take the deal and she'll face this criminal justice system. And I think it's fair to say that none of these people were your friends. They were just people you did business with. They weren't like you had no emotional loyalty to them whatsoever. And I think it's fair to say that 100% of the people in this room would have taken the deal to stay out of jail. And you said, no, you said, I'm not taking the deal. I choose accountability, which is why your example is important because it's so extreme. Um, and what I have learned from the people that I've talked to, and which is um, men, the, mo the more senior they get, the more, the better skilled they are at the, at the shield. Uh, the better skilled they are at giving the answer to avoid the question, the better skilled they are at masking vulnerability or even showing vulnerability. Um, and if they do, they're really good at faking it too. Um, and so the ones that truly do the work are the ones that even in private, I don't expect them to necessarily make grand pronouncements, who um, display their, their humanity and accept accountability and want to be better for whatever, whatever reason. Um, and it is a pretty amazing thing when you sit with someone powerful and they cry. Um, and f f there are some people in this room who are my friends and so you'll know this, but I have a rule with all of my friends, which is there's no crying alone. Uh, that no if, crying alone. No crying right. alone. Okay. That if you are in a state where that level of emotion, if you start talking about something that you know tears are gonna follow, you immediately pick up the phone and call me or somebody else, mm -hmm. and there's no crying alone, it's just not allowed. And um, the willingness to allow someone to sit in mud with you is, the, is what it is to be human. I think it is the, it is the greatest honor. And I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, which is you know, when our friends are struggling, our instinct is to rescue them, to pull them out of the mud, to fix, to fix. And if you're the one sitting in the mud when somebody attempts to fix, even if it's well-intentioned, it, it is a horrible feeling. Just don't do that. You're making it worse. And what true friendship is, is not the desire to fix or pull the friend out of the mud who you really wanna see out of the mud, but it's your willingness to sit in the mud with them to get in the mud and turn to them and, and say, this sucks, you know? And it's not fun being in the mud with them. You don't wanna get in the mud with them, um, but you choose to get in the mud with them until they're ready to say, can we get out now? But you sit there with them and that's a friend of mine who is one of those folks, I hadn't talked to him in a while and I called him up and be like, what are you up to? I haven't talked in a while and he, he opened up and it was intense. And I was like, why didn't you call me? He's like, I didn't want to bother you. And the end of our, the way we ended the phone call is I said, I didn't say, I'm always here, I'll be here. You know, I took my go on sort of mentality. And the way we ended the phone call is like, listen, um, and he's, in a, he's, he's depressed and he's in a bad place. The way we ended the phone call is I said, listen, um, don't be an asshole and deny me the honor of being there for you. Like, don't, you have no right to deny me. Very teary day today. <laughs> I think that it's, you don't know how healing and how cathartic it is to get in the mud with someone, to make your life about something greater than yourself, to 
give of yourself to help another person until you walk through it. And I have seen, after everything fell apart in my life, uh, other than being a convicted, I, I was also, um, I, had, I had a huge dependence on drugs and alcohol. And I went to, I, I was part of a 12-step program, which was the best education of my life. And what I would see is people walk in to these rooms, done, finished, life burned to the ground, hated themselves, were so spiritually sick that they would rather be killing themselves than be present. And it wasn't putting down the drug or the alcohol. It started to be about the work you do with forgiveness and living a more principled life. But when you see the lights truly go back on, when you see a human being become healed from that almost impossible state of being, is when they turn around and they share it with another one. When they sponsor another person, yeah. when they walk another person through the fire, that's when you see that human being transform. AA is magical. It is. Um, and we know, we, we all sort of know the first step is admitting you have a problem, but I think people don't realize what the 12th step is. Right. And AA knows this, which is if you master all 11 steps and not the 12th, you're probably going to succumb to the disease. Right. But if you can master the 12th step, you're more likely to beat it. The That's 12th right. step is to help another alcoholic. That's right. The 12th step is service. That's right. And you learn more as the person who steps in the mud to be with the other person than the person being in the mud. No question. And Brene Brown talks about this all the time, which is we don't build trust by um, offering help. We build trust by asking for it. Huge step. And, and a huge living example of, of this, the truth of, of what you talk about. Um, can we take the sacrifice too far? Yes. I mean, the simple answer is yes. Yes. Um, service is not martyrdom. And I think that, and I've seen this, you see it in various forms, um, but, you know, where you start, it's, it's, it's sort of the, the sort of opposite side of the spectrum of people who need immense amount of external validation, like likes and mm. followers to, to feel good about themselves, which is if I... If I, all I do is help others at great personal sacrifice, I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. And to the point of complete self-destruction. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it in many forms. Um, you know, this, contro this is controversial, but Mother Teresa apparently, in the, they found these letters after she died where she started to question the existence of God mm. and wasn't a happy person. And she's the poster child for like giving your life completely to others um, and never thinking about yourself. And... Um, uh, I've seen this with like young, young, um, young leaders. I, I knew this young leader, she had a couple of direct reports. I think she was a first time manager and she would send her folks home at a reasonable hour because she, didn't, she wanted to create a good work environment where they weren't working late and then she would stay at work every day till 11 or 12 to finish their work because she felt that that was being a good leader is sacrificing herself constantly for her people um, to the point where she's burning out and they get lazy because they're like, bye, she's gonna finish it, you know? Um, and it has the opposite experience. Um, and the reality is, and this has been talked about multiple times, even by folks on the, on the stage, uh, you know, on, on this event, at this event, which is struggle really matters. You know, you know, overcoming a difficult task and feeling proud of getting through it or working late and being like, I did that, you know? Um, it, it's, it's not only shared hardship is actually it produces relationship. I mean, if you go through struggle with someone, you do actually, do, you do build bond. Um, um, and, you know, it, I think we've moved away from helicopter parents and we've become like sort of duvet parents where everything is a soft landing, you know? Um, and I think, Not my experience, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think um, we've become very uncomfortable with discomfort. Um, and I think discomfort is part of the work of being human and learning to be uncomfortable, not to avoid it, but learning how to, how to manage it. So, uh, yeah, there is such thing as, as too much service. Yes. My dad calls it constructive suffering. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's very good. Um, which means it's managed, which means it's not throw you in the deep end, but it's throwing the deep end, but I'm standing on the side just in case. I'm, right. It's, right. It's managed. Yeah. Right. 
That's good. Um, I want to see, I want to take some questions from the audience. Can we turn the house lights up, please? Yeah. Right back there. You, you, yes. Just shout. Shout, and I'll repeat it. Hi. Thank you. Just shout. Okay. We're going to repeat the question. <laughs> So the question is, is, has my definition of success and achievement changed? Apparently on page 180. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that book is older than 10 years. Uh, I, I make the distinction that um, ach achievement matters because success is just a feeling. And so when we talk about, you know, you, you don't say, are you successful? But do you feel successful? I mean, that's really what it is, right? Because are you successful? We, semantic, but we confuse with achievement. Like, I have accomplished this. And human beings are tangibly driven animals. Um, we need milestones. We need metrics. Those are, there's nothing wrong with that. But the important thing is, is that to what end? And so you can have achievement, but not feel successful. There, we all know people who've achieved remarkable things, but aren't happy people. They don't feel successful. They keep working harder and harder, hoping that that feeling will come. And yet we all know people who, by you know, Western standards, haven't achieved much, but feel very successful. Um, and so um, I think uh, you know, the idea of pursuing happiness, which is sort of a, an industry now, it's a cottage industry, you know, I think is, uh, I, 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 I don't know if you can, I don't know if that's true. You know, I think you can, uh, if you pursue, I, I, there's no, I don't, there's no skill set to pursue happiness. You know, what do I, but I think if you pursue things like better relationships, I think if you pursue things like empathy, if you pursue things like finding balance between social media and my real life, you know, uh, the best definition, the best description of Instagram I just saw, which is uh, um, happy pictures of unhappy people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the point is, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. The balance is off. So uh, I, I think to, to understand that a, a achievement towards something um, is more likely to produce feelings of success because what you're counting is momentum rather than absolutes. And momentum is the thing. And the thing that I go to when I feel like my reminder is the women's suffrage movement in the United States, is that every single founder of the women's suffrage movement in the United States had died of natural causes before the first women voted. Do you feel that they were successful on their deathbeds? I can guarantee you the answer is yes. It's because they could see the momentum that they were building and though they had wished it happened in their lifetime, I guarantee they died with confidence that it was gonna happen. And that to me is where the feeling of success comes from, that you're contributing to the flywheel, you're contributing to the momentum and the achievement is very focused. Hi. Sure. He said success is being the best you can be. In other words, second place isn't necessarily the first loser. Yeah, I mean, John, he's quoting John Wooden, the, one of the winning most coaches of all time, that success is being the best you can be, and second place is not necessarily for his loser. And I think it's also worth adding that Wooden, one of the most successful coaches in history, was not obsessed with winning. He was obsessed with team building. And a version of, I've always lived that I am my competition. Absolutely. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, so, Simon, I think to probably everyone in the room, I have something would be that you would be viewed 
as successful. Um, obviously, you've achieved a lot. Do you view yourself as successful? And if you do, or if you don't, what, do you, what are the things that have made you feel like you have been successful or not? Next question. Ooh, no, no, no. <laughs> Can. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, she asked. She asked, uh, "Am I successful? Do I feel like I'm successful?" Uh, and something like that. Um, <laughs> and how do I know or don't know? Um, <laughs> uh, the answer is, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I, I, the way I've always viewed my career is like an iceberg which is when I first had a vision of what the world could be, I saw the iceberg beneath the ocean and nothing was sticking above the ocean. Only I could see what was beneath. It was called vision. It lived in my imagination. And people would be like, eh. And I got a bit better at it describing it in words that other people could imagine what I can imagine. And that means a little bit of the iceberg popped up because somebody else could see it. But it's still in our imaginations. And then I could do some work that would spread the message a little more, and now more people could see it. So there's a little more iceberg. And so people would say, it's amazing what you did. And I'd be like, tip of the iceberg. <laughs> um, and then as time progressed, um, more of the iceberg showed up, and books and talks and talks that go viral. I mean, I've been fortunate to win the internet lottery a couple of times. And, um, and no matter how much iceberg is sticking above the ocean, which is how people are judging my success, look how successful you are because they're looking above the ocean. What I see is so much more beneath the ocean. And so I'm, I know I'm supposed to celebrate above the ocean, but I spend most of my time looking beneath the ocean. And so no matter what I've done or how the people want to define success, and they say things like, you're so successful, my answer still is tip of the iceberg. Um, and for me, again, momentum matters more than anything. And you know, if, if, there's, if there's one thing I'm really proud of, you know, rather than feeling of success, if there's one thing I'm really proud of, it's that the concept of why is part of the vernacular. That I can read a newspaper and it'll say this company clearly didn't know their why. With no reference to me, the journalist probably had no idea where it came from. And, uh, and that is now a universally accepted concept which wasn't the case a bunch of years ago. In other words, I found language that made the idea of purpose at work a real thing. I'm very proud of that. Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm even more proud of the fact that most people don't know where it came from. And to me, success is the impact, not the credit. And so I guess I do feel successful. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. Go on a, a pie. A pie. Yeah, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that struggle is valuable. And I'm curious to ask, when can you actually recognize that you're pushing yourself too hard and, and how to potentially avoid burnout? Um, uh, this is where relationships matter. Um, you know, I, I, it's, not a, it's not a fair question because it's not a formula, right? Um, um, and what I have learned is that the quality of our relationships will have direct impact on the quality and ability we have to push ourselves beyond our own limits. So, um, you know, all you need is one person in your life who says, you got this, I believe in you, and you will find courage and energy to do things that you would not have had before. But more importantly, um, that person needs to also say, and if everything goes wrong, I will be there for you, and I will be there with you, and I will be in the mud with you, um, and has the ability to say, something's wrong, I'm worried about you. 
Um, and I think burnout happens when you're attempting to do all of the things you see other people do and not realize that they have deep, meaningful relationships that you can't see. And you think, falsely, that you have to do it alone. Uh, and, and that's when burnout happens. Because you don't, as an individual, have the energy. But in community and in relationship and in friendship, um, it's remarkable, including knowing when to just take a little break to recharge. And family. And family. Family counts absolutely for those relationships. I wish we had more time. I know there's so many more questions. Simon, I think two of the most important questions we can ask ourselves as human beings, who are we gonna fight for and how are we gonna do it? And you have answered this and continue to answer this with your life. Thank you so much for being a big part of creating a, a better world for all of us. And this has been a profound honor. Thank you.